And then I read The Wisdom of Insecurity by Alan Watts, who is a, a Buddhist uh, writer. Uh, essentially, what I learned from that is all we have is now. So when I, when I was a teenager, what do people talk to you about when you're a teenager? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you get out of school? Are you going to school? What are you going to study? I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, if somebody had told me at 18 that I'd be standing here doing this right now, I'd still be laughing. <laughs> so, what I got from that is that all we really have is now. Actually, if you can direct all your attention to the present moment, and I tried it. What the heck? I was, you know, out of high school by this time and working on my dad's dairy farm, so I had plenty of time. I had plenty of now, which, you know, was filled with what I usually consider to be unpleasant tasks. Cleaning the barn, shoveling silage, milking cow. And, and we heated with wood, and my dad uh, never owned a chainsaw in his life, but he sure liked to cut wood, so we have this man crash cut saw. And I will tell you something, that if you're doing that with my father, you are in the present moment all the time. Because <laughs> he reminds you. Sweet guy, don't get me wrong. But he had, he had ideas about cutting wood. And, and years later, I learned that what I was doing, those are mindfulness practices. I'm directing my attention so like if I have to fill up a wagon with silage and I'm thinking about all the crap I want to do, maybe I'm going to go out drinking afterwards. So I'm thinking about that. Well, you know, then it's unpleasant and it smells bad and, you know, i got to get done with this. But if I'm directing all of my attention to what I'm doing, I get done quicker because guess what, oddly enough, there's some technique to shut with silage. <laughs> And my mood is good throughout the whole thing because there isn't in anything that's inherently uh, devastatingly bad about any of those tasks that I was called upon to do. And then I discovered that when I wasn't thinking bad thoughts about other things, the stuff that I previously did like and thought was making me miserable was really okay. Does that make sense? By the way, uh, I know I'm moving kind of fast, so uh, feel free to jump in with questions or comments or what, whatever, because this is a broad overview of uh, how things work. So kind of going on this uh, uh, notion of the present moment, uh, is a quote from Helen Keller, security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And it kind of fits in with what uh, uh, Judy was saying earlier about, you know, get out there and do stuff. Now, because I've been inhibited by my anxiety from doing things, I made a conscious choice that I have to do something, even if it turns out that it's a mistake later, and trust me, I, I made plenty of those, but doing nothing, that's what depression feeds on. And by the way, over the years, I, I, I came to have this visualization about depression. To me, depression is a big, nasty monster that wants to kill me. And the way I avoid being killed by the big nasty monster is to starve it to death. So how do you starve it to death? What does it feed on? It feeds on inactivity. Because if you ain't doing anything, you've got this... The human brain is a very powerful thing. Well, it isn't good at just sitting. So it generates thoughts for you, sometimes random. And, you know, if you're kind of in a crappy mood, what, are you, what kind of thoughts are you going to generate? Crappy thoughts, which will in turn generate more crappy thoughts. And hence the downward spiral. So like I tell my, my clients when they don't want to get out of bed, I say, look, uh, uh, 
you know, if, if you give into it, you'll never get out of it. Which incidentally is almost identical to what my father told me one day when I was telling him about my difficulty getting out of bed in the morning. It's when I figured out that he too suffered from depression for many years. Anyway. But you don't know these things when you're a little kid. Now, I'm going to introduce at this time uh, the, the mental health continuum, which everybody is on the mental health continuum somewhere. And it, you know, it's, it looks like a kind of like a number line from, from uh, algebra class, right? Now, we move. And, and so if we're moving in this direction, you're becoming more functional. Right? If you're moving in the other direction, you're becoming less functional. So, and the zero point, that's where you're able to get your needs met. So, when we're full in Atwater, we've got 14 people who are somewhere over here because somebody has deemed that these folks need 24 hour supervision for some reason. So our job is to get them to move over to where they don't need 24 hour supervision. Now, we know that things can happen to send people in the less functional direction, right? Um, trauma. My guess would be that if you were to go to Japan right now, you could probably fill like trains and boats and stuff full of people who were perfectly fine a while ago. And then, you know, the earthquake and the tsunami and the radioactivity and, you know, that thing last night that they're, 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 now they're having jellyfish clogging up their fish nets and can't get fish away. These are the kinds of things that move people. And, and um, it, it's, it's what uh, the uh, illness management recovery people call the stress vulnerability model, where you are vulnerable to certain stressors, things to say. And as we just discussed, the way you move in this direction is there is a natural growth that takes place unless something interferes with it. And then there's things you can do that will help that. You can find another person to talk to, get your emotional needs met, your needs for uh, acceptance and, and unconditional love. Humans are social animals. I was giving this talk a uh, while well, well, ago to uh, the NAMI group here, and there was a guy in there who was very upset by this. Human beings are not animals. Oh, uh, yeah, we kind of are. You know, we breathe air, we move around, we eat, we do all those things animals do. Human beings need to belong to a group. We have one of our instincts is to see ourselves as part of a group. Maybe it's a group of only two people. But it's a group nonetheless. And someone who doesn't see themselves as part of a group, you can bet that they have, or someone has constructed these walls around them that they're feeling uh, cut off from the rest of the humanity. We have a need for emotional intimacy like we talked about. In the L word. Um, it's been my experience that people are, are often reluctant to use the word love because it has, you know, there's different meanings in the dictionary. There's meaning one and meaning two. Now, what I'm talking about here is unconditional acceptance and positive regard. Uh, we all absolutely need it, and it, like I said when I was talking about Maslow, if we don't get it, 
eventually we're going to die sooner than we would if we had God. <coughs> and we get that from other people. Now I included this quote, Other Men Are Lenses Through Which We Read Our Own Minds. Um, going back to my client that was talking to his relative over there, he risked a little bit. Okay? We just sort of threw that out there. And I'll be darned if uh, he was validated because she unconditionally accepted him and then she in turn felt comfortable to have this intimate conversation about, I'm guessing, a pretty sensitive issue when you're talking about your own child's suicide. Uh, Mental health is everybody's business. I just threw this slide in there because, you know, I just can't emphasize it enough. We all, everyone in this room, everyone in this building, everyone in Kansas, Ohio County, we're all in the same boat. We're on that continuum somewhere. Uh, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, 26% of American adults in any given year will have a diagnosable mental illness. Because as we know, there is the problem of the undiagnosed. And that's, you know, when you're in cash buy, there's somebody there that's really pissing you off. <laughs> Guess what? They're probably in the 26% over here. You know, they probably at very least have a personality disorder or something. Then there was this other study that they did in New Zealand. It was a, a lifetime study. And their conclusion was that everybody at some point has a diagnosable mental illness. I mean, you may pass right through it, like, you know, you have a cold or the flu or something. But it's everybody's business, which is why it really irks the crap out of me when I see people in St. Paul, in Washington, not getting it. Well, we could just put these people in jail. Well, okay then. I can sick her. Good idea. There we get off the uh, soapbox here for a minute. <laughs> okay, now, this next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the techniques that we use these days to move people along the continuum. And I'm going to compare that to what I did in my own life. I was kind of my own therapist, sort of. 